we are very fortunate um, tonight to have uh, Steffi uh, Weisbrod uh, with us, and she's worked incredibly hard over the last several months, at least maybe six months, um, putting this together. Um, but before I do that, before I introduce Steph, I want to um, give a little shout out to our next speaker series, which I mentioned already was going to be on September 25th uh, in the fall. And uh, I'm extremely excited about it. Uh, and this speaker series is going to be called Atencio versus New Mexico. And this is the lawsuit that was filed uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, by the Center for Biological Diversity and has gotten a lot of interest uh, from a lot of people, uh, including uh, the government and the oil and gas industry. And the presenter will be uh, the lead attorney in this lawsuit uh, named Gail Evans, who has worked for the Center of Biological Diversity for some time now. And uh, it, it should be uh, uh, a different kind of evening than this evening, but uh, riveting, I would think. Uh, it's it's quite quite a piece uh, Gail's bitten off for herself. And um, so that will be, again, September, Monday, September 25th at 6.30 in, on many of these same stations. Um, so without further ado, let's, let's jump to the task at hand. Um, Electrify New Mexico. Our presenter tonight is uh, Steffi Weisberg, and Steffi has a, is a member of the 350 Steering Committee and on the board of New Mexico Solar, Solar Energy Association. Um, and that only gives a hint of what she does. Um, she is one of the hardest working uh, people in the core team in 350 New Mexico, and that's not an easy distinction to come by. Uh, so I, I think you will get a better sense of that after this evening's, this evening's presentation. Uh, Steffi hails from California, where she earned a master's in applied physics from Stanford University. She was a science journalist at Science News Magazine, a congressional analyst, the author of two poetry books, and most recently, the K through 12 outreach manager for the UNM School of Engineering. She says she started Electrify New Mexico website towards the end of the New Mexico legislative session, this recent one, when she was frustrated by the lack of progress on the climate legislation, but excited by the enormous potential of the Inflation Reduction Act and other incentives to accelerate the transition to a clean energy and mind and mind blowing uh, electric appliances. So uh, hang on to your seats. Uh, Steffi, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And I'm going to have, I have a short um, PowerPoint, and then I will give you a tour of our new uh, website very, very soon. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start with this slide because a lot of people don't really know what the 350 in our name means, and it uh, stands for the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in parts per million. Um, 350 is kind of the upper limit of where we would like to be where it's still safe for the climate. And obviously, as everyone knows, it's um, unfortunately up in the 420s now. Um, having uh, concentrations of carbon dioxide up at that level, along with um, other greenhouse gases, as we all know, um, traps heat in the atmosphere and warms our planet. And unfortunately, living in New Mexico, we all know the repercussions of that. Um, but we're very lucky in that we know what causes it, burning fossil fuels for transportation, electric power, and um, heating our homes and water. Um, and 
even better news, we have some great proven technologies that we can um, exchange for our fossil fuel uh, technology. And uh, that's what beneficial electrification is all about. We generate the electricity with renewable clean power and um, we use some uh, electric uh, technology to heat our buildings, cool and uh, cool the buildings and heat our water, cook our food and to move us around. But that's not the only reason to electrify. And that's because there are a lot of really cool uh, appliances and equipment that um, we can use that are really advanced since when I was um, doing this as a kid. I don't know if any of you have used induction cooktop yet, but um, it, like a lot of other electric appliances, are fast, precise, and responsive. Um, they can, today I boiled some eggs and I put it in the pot and I put the timer on and I walked away. And I think they're still in there actually. <laughs> I don't think I took them out. But um, they, they get done really fast and they're safe and you just don't have to worry about them. On our website, we have some videos showing chefs cooking and um, you'll see how fast they are if you haven't tried them yet. Um, electric appliances, especially the ones that we have inside our house are better and healthier for us because we're not burning fossil fuels inside our house. If you get electric appliances, you can get rid of your carbon monoxide detector because there will be no carbon monoxide in your house along with all the other um, uh, chemicals that get produced when we burn fossil fuels. Um, all these uh, electric appliances are also very, very efficient. Um, for example, a heat pump, which both cools and heats your house, is uh, three to five times more efficient at heating your house than, say, a gas furnace is. And because all these electric technologies are so efficient, they are cheaper to run and maintain. Uh, here, for example, is a Chevy Bolt. Um, and I looked up also a comparable uh, gasoline powered car, Honda Civic, um, that costs about the same. And the equivalent miles per gallon um, uh, fuel economy for electric cars are 120 to 140. You really can't beat that. And because the fuel economy is so high, the fuel cost is really low. For the Bolt, it's about a third of what it is for the Civic. And on top of that, because electric cars have um, so few moving parts, um, they are a lot cheaper to maintain. There's no oil changes, transmission fluid, and all of that. Um, here's an example of another um, uh, electric appliance that is very um, efficient. We just put one in in our house, a heat pump water heater. And as you can see from the, the graphic, it costs a lot less to run um, than comparable uh, water heaters. Uh, the downside of this switching is that, well, it's expensive to, to um, buy all these new uh, equipment. But fortunately, again, uh, we have the Inflation Reduction Act. And along with um, there are incentives in New Mexico from utilities, rural co-ops, and the state has some. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act is a once in a generation um, opportunity for us to completely change the nature of how we live. And really that's what, when Jim said, why I started this was because I was feeling like we've we've all been handed this to actually do something about climate change that we can really make a significant difference. Um, and we, for some people, the Inflation Reduction Act will enable them, um, lower income people to get some of these appliances for free. And for other people, it will make it um, affordable. Um, the other really good news is that this, there's a wonderful website called Rewiring America, which helps us navigate the tax credits and the um, rebates that are available for the Inflation Reduction Act. 
And so um, I rely a lot on that in making our website, but I built on top of that um, to add New Mexico specific information. So um, I, I have links everywhere to um, all of the uh, rebates that you can get from New Mexico utilities and, and rural electric co-ops. And then I add other information where that I learned about um, that are based on where we live. So for example, uh, heat pumps. Uh, I, I'll show you some of those examples, some of the information that I added for heat pumps. Now, as I mentioned, uh, heat pumps are used for both heating and cooling. So if you're thinking of replacing your um, swamp cooler um, or your air conditioner is on its last legs, or if you are have been um, nursing along a, a, your, your heater or your boiler, your furnace or your boiler, now might be a good time to start thinking about a heat pump. Um, and they're very versatile. You can put them in one room, you can put them in a whole house, um, whether you have ducts or not. And contrary to what you may have heard, they uh, work very well in cold climates. And um, I've just been reading some articles about people in Alaska ditching um, a fuel oil and, and other um, fossil fuels for, for putting um, heat pumps in. The reason that heat pumps are so much more efficient is because unlike fossil fuel furnaces, they don't burn any energy to generate heat. And it's, this is where it's kind of mind blowing because they actually collect heat from the air, if it's an air source heat pump or the ground, if it's a ground source heat pump and they move it to where it needs to be or where it does not need to be. Um, and that's where the energy is put in, is just moving it around. And, and so that's why it's so much more efficient. So some of the information that I put in our website are things that are specific to New Mexico. So for example, how the our altitude affects the sizing of a heat pump. I put links and summarized this um, study that was done by the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project that talks about what kind of scenarios are probably most economic depending in which um, climate zone you live in. Um, and you know, if you get a contractor, there they should know this, but um, the contract this a lot of this information is kind of new to contractors too. Every contractor I have spoken to, had no idea that there's money for them in the Inflation Reduction Act, and they didn't know about the incentives for their customers. And this is one area where we really need to promote um, some education um, because uh, what I think contractors, their first inclination is just to give you a gas appliance. Um, and that's because that has been traditionally the cheapest thing you could put in. And that's what people want right away. So that's what the contractors do. But I think we're in a whole new paradigm now. And um, we, we need to think about the long run and with the incentives, um, heat pumps can be a lot less expensive. Um, I also put in um, some examples of how the different um, in incentives are applied. Um, this, for example, was um, three families in um, Edgewood. Um, this is where near where, where I live, excuse me. <clears throat> this was for um, a 2,500 uh, foot house in Edgewood. Um, and this was a, a fairly big um, uh, heat pump system uh, that would be around $15,000 for a full ducted system. And after applying the IRA rebates and tax credits, and there they have a, um, their uh, rural electric co-op has a really good rebate. Um, so for the uh, low income family, they would end up paying uh, for a $15,000 uh, heat pump about $2,500. A middle income family um, about 3,000 and a high income family would get about 5,000 off. I should mention, however, that 
if a low income family lived in a smaller house, say 1500, then they could probably would get a heat pump closer, it would cost probably more around $8,000. And there's a full rebate for that. So that would be a situation where um, somebody in, in that income uh, category would probably get a heat pump for free. But the purpose of this was just to show how, um, how these rebates and um, tax credits in New Mexico would be applied. Um, another thing that when you're making your decision about whether it makes sense to get a heat pump, um, I thought this was really cool. This was in the Washington Post showing all the different um, kinds of fuels that people use in New Mexico. Um, methane, which is natural gas, propane, wood, electricity. Where I live, a lot of people, including us, are on propane, and it is really expensive. And it turns out that it, wood, and electricity, and by that I mean electrical resistance, like base, um, baseboard heating, um, there, it's a no-brainer switching to a heat pump right away, you'll be saving money. Methane and natural gases, um, you kind of have to um, do some calculations yourself. Uh, Rewiring America did calculations for New Mexico, and they think on average people will save money um, switching um, from natural gas to electric heat pump. Um, but you might want to do a calculation yourself, and on our website, um, we show you how to do it. So I did this for Jim uh, based on his real gas bills, and, and on our website, we tell you how you can do it, how, where the calculation, calculator is, where to get the information, um, how to download it from your, from your gas company. And um, in his case, it's kind of a wash. But there's a lot of other reasons why you should get the heat pump, and it's also covering his um, his um, air conditioning as well. So, I'm recommending to Jim that he um, convert to, to a heat pump. Um, so, that's uh, that's it for the um, for my PowerPoint. And now I'm going to give you a little tour of our website. So here we are, everyone can see that. So this is a 350's website, our main website, and you can see on top here's a Electrify New Mexico. And there's a menu that takes you down to all the different parts of the website. Um, or you can just click on the main page and see see everything from here. Um, I have disclaimers that says I'm not a CPA, we're not tax professionals, so please um, either contact the IRS or your own tax advisor before you make any decisions about that. Also, um, I have been having cataract surgery through this whole thing, so if you find typos or anything, please let us know and if there's anything, uh, if you find any areas, uh, errors. Um, I will get back to this section uh, uh, in a minute. Uh, there are some very important things to know before you start. Um, this shows a, uh, a, a very intimidating um, picture of all the things that you could do to electrify. Um, but you can start with very simple things, it, uh, you know, depending on you know, what, what your priorities are. Um, below that picture, we have um, different squares for different subject matters, and if you click on those, you can get to those um, different areas. We've got um, weatherization and windows, which is, um, that's probably the first step that you should do is, um, I, I'll go there first just to show you, um, if you put a lot of money and effort into um, a heat pump or a heat pump water heater and then all this energy is leaking out of your house that's kind of a waste so um, the first thing that you should do is an energy audit and here we have um, links to how you can find one in new mexico and uh 
also that many of the utilities offer uh, free energy um, audits. So you can definitely take advantage of that. And so do a lot of the rural electric co-ops. Um, we there some of these co-ops give really good uh, rebates for um, all kinds of wonderful things, including uh, audits, um, heat pumps, chainsaws, all kinds of things. Um, some some more than others. Um, and then uh, the next step after the energy audit is to fix the, what's called the envelope. So that's windows, doors, um, insulation, and I have um, information here about that. And by the way, this includes window coverings. So if you were wanting to get some of those um, of these kinds of uh, window coverings, um, there's a tax credit for that. I, I have windows I need to put film on, um, and I think that's what we're going to do this, this year. Um, here's more on insulation, and there's state um, uh, credits for that as well. And then um, for weatherization, there's a ton of resources for low-income residents that where these are basically all free. And you can save so much energy by making sure your house isn't leaky. So that's definitely the first thing to do. And then we'll get back to these other things. And then I have um, a long list of ways to, to decide where you want to start. And you don't need to do this at all. This is just if you're really lost. Um, but the first thing, again, after energy audit is to maybe make a list of your appliances and their ages. And I have links here to how you find their ages and what typical appliance lifespans are. Um, and and then a list of things that might help you clarify what your values are and where you what your reasons for electrification are and and where you really want to start. Um, so I'm going to go back here to what you need to know the most. So and those there are really two things you need to know before you start. Uh, one has to do with the incentives. So there are rebates, uh, which you can get from uh, utilities, um, rural electric co-ops, and you should uh, really understand how, before you think you can get a rebate, you should definitely figure, you know, make, confirm that this is how you get them. And they're all different. Um, I'd like to show you, I assume a lot of people are with PNM, and I find their uh, websites very, very confusing. So I'd like to show you here is one of their uh, rebate pages. This says for a whole home evaporative cooler, and you can get $300 for it. Nowhere on this page does it say heat pump. But if you go to the terms and conditions, and then you look down here, it says heat pumps, heat pump water heaters and smart thermostats. And that's that's where you find this information is in the terms and conditions. They PM also has a program called Midstream uh, Cooling Program. And in that program, your contractor uh, works with PM to get a heat pump um, at a wholesale price. And that's also listed on the on their website, but you have to know and you really have to dig. And I have that listed in the heat pump section. Um, but the biggest rebates are gonna come from the inflation reduction um, program. And uh, I'm gonna go back, that tells you about them. And the way you find out about them is from the wonderful Rewiring America catalog. And they have um, this calculator and I'll go there in a second. The problem with them is they will not be available until the end of this year, beginning of next year. And that's because they have to be implemented by the states. And that means we're relying on our agencies to um, figure out how to put them together. 
And that, and what these rebates are point of sale rebates. So when you go to buy um, your heat pump water heater, somehow the store has to know that you are fall in an income category and you deserve um, a rebate. And so that's going to take a lot of work. But this is um, this is the rewiring calculator that is just so wonderful, and it helps you figure out whether you qualify for a rebate or not. The qualifications are based on what's called the area median income, and that is in turn um, depends on your your income, how many people are in your household, and what your zip code is. So that's why these calculators are awesome. And this is actually I put in numbers for a friend of mine. So um, when you you calculate it, it says that she can get. Um, up to 100% of the cost of um, for, for, for uh, rebates. And I'll show you, for example, again, for a heat pump. Um, so she's in the, the lower income category. That means she, for a heat pump, she would get 100% rebate up to $8,000. So she actually does live in a 1300 square foot house. And if she got a, a heat pump, she could get one. Um, for, I think they have in here, I can't remember. Oh yeah, here. Um, they have estimates for what the cost of heat pumps will be for different size houses. So for her, it really would be $8,000 and she would basically get a heat pump for free. The next category up is moderate income and they would get a rebate for half the cost of a heat pump um, up to $8,000. So um, these, ca these calculators are really great. And then it also talks about the tax credits um, and the, that she could get. And these are all available now. And you can uh, click on these and, and see. Um, so she could also get a tax credit. Um, whoops. Sorry, I hope I'm not making anybody sick. <laughs> uh, here's the tax credit. So um, this is a protect, particular tax credit, 30% capped at 2000. So it's not as generous as the rebate, but um, she could get that as well. So, um, and by the way, these rebates, we can thank Senator Heinrich because he, um, he wrote the bill that that got these rebates going in the first place. So um, those are rebates. There's another whole rebate program um, called HOMES. <laughs> and I'm not gonna go into that. That also relies on the state. That also is probably gonna not come out for a year or two. Again, here contractors are eligible for um, some rebates, uh, 500, 200. Um, so tell your contractor. Um, they deserve to get a little money too. Um, then come these tax credits. And here is the state of New Mexico tax credits. Um, the Unlike the federal tax credits, which are non-refundable, that means that you have to owe the tax in order to get the credit. If you don't owe any tax, you will not get the credit. If you only owe part of the tax, that's that's uh, uh, the if you if you owe a certain amount that's less than the credit, that's all of the credit you will get. Um, whereas the um, the New Mexico tax credits are refundable, which is really good. Um, so you get the whole amount, um, but they're only for homeowners and business owners, and then this is what they are for. So they have heat pumps and windows and doors and getting your house ready for EVs. And then there's a solar tax credit. Um, the federal tax credits, um, you have to be careful, read the fine print. And again, the rewiring uh, calculator will help you. Um, so, and, and there are tax credits for contractors too. So you can read about that. So that's the one thing to know about. The second thing is um, that you need to know a little bit about your home's electrical system. So if your home was 
built before the 1980s. Thank you, Andrew Stone. Um, he showed, told me about this. Uh, probably your electrical panel or your breaker box is, it may not be able to handle all the current that all of this um, uh, electrification is going to require. So um, your breaker box is kind of like the traffic cop. It takes all the electricity that's coming into your house from the grid and directs it to all the different uh, circuits that in your house. And older houses may be able to accommodate 60 amps. Um, you probably need at least 100, maybe 200 amps. Uh, mega mansions that are being these big houses now are having 400 to 600 amps. But 200 amps is probably a good point to where you want to be. Um, the other thing is that some of these appliances, like an EV charger, a level two charger, which is what you probably want, um, you don't need, absolutely have to have, but if you're installing a charger, that's that'll charge your car overnight pretty easily. You need 240 volt outlets. Um, so both of these things uh, you, you might have to do, and you might want to do them uh, early on in your, your um, electrification plan um, so that the electrician doesn't have to come back a second time, and that'll be cheaper. So I'll show you this um, in this case study uh, that rewiring um, provides uh, to show you what's possible, see how they've put their panel um, and wiring work early on so that the electrician doesn't have to come back um, a second time. And you can see it's expensive, $5,000 um, to, to upgrade the, the panel. So um, it has to be done early. However, um, there are some workarounds, and I have links to that here. Uh, for example, um, you might be able to have um, a circuit splitter and share uh, between a dryer and a or washer dryer and your EV charger. Um, you also might be able to have um, a smart panel that uh, use a software to direct when electricity is going in, in different areas. Um, and there you, some, I read, I was reading something else about having a sub panel. So these are things you, you sh can talk to your uh, contractor about to maybe avoid having to do that expensive um, panel upgrade. Um, and as far as the appliances go that need the 240 volts, um, these are, this is what rewiring said about the appliances that, that would need those. All of these uh, have manufacturers now that are working on 120 volt uh, models. Uh, so for example, for a heat pump water heater, here's a, a, a review of a heat pump water heater uh, that can just be put right back in the place of um, of where your water, your other water heater is right now, and you wouldn't need to do those upgrades. But that's the point of uh, just forewarning you that this, these are things that you might have to do. So those are my two Im most important points. Um, I I could stop now um, and take questions, or I could go. Um, and show you the things that I've learned. I'm just gonna tell you two more things that I've learned <laughs> in, in, in doing some of this. Um, in the solar and storage, um, I wanna warn you of two things. Um, what you should know before you begin, and this is a lot like the electric panel, the more the more electric appliances that we put in, the more solar we're going to need if you can afford that to power it. And um, this has happened to us already. 
Uh, and this also tells you why the legislature is so important. Um, so there's this, this rule that you can only put in enough solar um, that you can't put in any solar that's above 120% of the electricity that you're using. And this legislative session, there was a bill to, to change that rule to say you can go above 120 because we, we're going to need more electricity soon. Um, and uh, the bill fell, failed. So um, this is a constraint on how much so, you know, solar we can generate ourselves. And so I was sorry about that. The other thing is when you're installing solar, be careful when you get near a 10 kilowatt system um, because your insurance can change. The, the way the utility treats you can change. And we're also dealing with that at our house. And finally, um, this, hap this came up with somebody um, I was emailing with last week. And I have a friend who had the same problem. Just to warn you about um, a company called Sunrun, which is Costco's partner. Just because Costco picks a company does not mean they've been vetted. And this particular company, Sunrun, which is one, I think the largest solar installation company in the country, um, has really bad marketing, uh, fraudulent marketing practices. And um, they've been sued and they took over the event, I think it's how you pronounce it, who also was Costco's partner. And so be careful about zero down solar deals and particularly from them. So there's a lot of good companies, local companies in solar here that um, are better. Sorry. Great, <laughs> Steffi, th thank uh, you for, for taking, a, uh, uh, taking us through that. Um, I, I want to just emphasize one thing uh, that you talked around, but I want to say it explicitly. Uh, Steffi has done an incredible job uh, laying out different scenarios for different people at different income levels, different houses, different areas in the state. As you can tell, there are an enormous number of individual uh, variables in this. So, so we can't possibly tonight say, oh, well, Julie, yeah, you should do blah, de, blah, de, blah, de, blah. It's just, you really need to find uh, someone, um, a contractor or electrical contractor or a heating and air conditioning contractor that comes recommended, hopefully from friends and, and get together with them because there are, a new, there are numerous variables that you'll have to answer in coming to the right plan uh, for you. Um, there's some, some things that are relatively simple, um, like putting in an, an induction stove. Let's say if you already have an induction, uh, if you already have an electric stove, then it's kind of plug and play. Um, but anything more complicated than that, if you're converting from a gas stove to uh, an induction stove and on and on and on. So, so um, I see some questions in the chat um, uh, ab about those kind of individual details and we can try to address them, but there isn't a substitute really for building a relationship with a local contractor. So that's yeah, my two cents. This is how we cook at our house right now. <laughs> Because we are on propane and um, I don't totally understand the reason, but I, it would be thousands and thousands of dollars. We don't, we don't have the, um, the wiring to get to our stove to make this. We can't make this whole cooktop all induction. So now <laughs> our son got us this for Christmas and we just put it on top of our propane burner and we have a toaster oven and and that's basically how we cook. <laughs> so, um, and I just want to say one other thing that I've learned and probably a lot of you have if you're in the market for an EV um, and you're frustrated with the lack of cars that you can get the tax credit for to buy. Leasing may be the answer. I've never personally leased, but um, there are a lot less restrictions on that. So that's the other thing I have learned. 
So with that, sure. I will. Yeah, I got some Q and A's uh, queued up yeah. for you, Stephanie. If you like me to read them off, I'll start with a couple of <clears throat> quick, easy ones. I think um, so. In your slide deck, you uh, showed a slide. I think during the sweep um, <clears throat> slide with some climat climatic zones. The question was: Are those climatic zones the same ones that are used in the New Mexico Energy Conservation Code? Do you happen to know that? I don't. But um, I I don't. But okay. I wouldn't be surprised if they were. Yes, I agree. Um, and you use the to refer to the uh, <clears throat> kind of heater called an electrical resistance heater, a baseboard heater. Can you define a little bit more about uh, what you mean by that? So um, that the way um, electric heaters work is that you basically have a wire and electricity goes through it and the electrons hit the wire and there's lots of friction and it gives off heat. And that's, that's you know, you see it, you can see it. But just like your toaster, if you look in your electric toaster, you see the element gets all red. That's, that's, that's electric heating. Um, or, or you see, you can buy the little, electric fans that turn with you know and heat up a room for space heating that's that's Good. what um, they are got it thanks um here's one uh, a little more detailed from Lori. uh she says she has a house a small house that's broken up by a lot of walls how can i find out if a heat pump would work in that kind of house um let me uh if you don't mind, I just want to show one picture that might be useful. Um, and maybe somebody with mini splits could also um, answer this question. Um, but in the heat pump, there's, let's see. So this is what um, I found this, if you guys can see this, this is what, um, how, they, how they figure out where they want, where you want to put mini splits. And you can see- You might see, want to define that term. So a mini split, sorry, thank you. A mini split is, th this is a system, this is the part that goes outside and then these are called heads and they go inside and um, you have these for um, when you don't have a ductwork in your house, and um, they you can use them. Um, you know they recommend them like if you you have a room that is always colder or hotter than you want, you could add this to adjust that. Or if you have an addition and you don't want to pull gas piping that way, um, or uh, you can even, you know, you can use them for every single room in your house and individually control um, all, all of those rooms. Nancy has one, um, um, but here they talk about, you know, about how far they go and they have lots of different walls here. So you, you would decide um, how many you would need and how big your zone is. Um, so some people start experimenting with a mini split and they might, I think I, I was reading, they, they just, you know, the largest area you might start with just to see how well that worked. Um, the thing is, if you, if you do have mini splits, um, you have to, and you want them to, to cover a large zone, you have to remember to keep the doors open unless you want a mini split in each separate little area. Um, I, I know, I don't know if Nancy wants to talk about that with hers or if anyone else has mini splits and would want to answer that question about lots uh, of- uh, Steffi, I'd just like to say one thing. This is a good example of what I had mentioned before. So this person who's interested in switching over to heat pumps, you have one would normally start out with a detailed look. You have some kind of heating system in your house now, right? I, I, I'm guessing, unless you sleep under an electric blanket all winter. But um, so you have to evaluate whether you can adopt your existing heating system to a heat pump 
or whether you have to start new, which would be like with mini splits. So that's a detailed discussion, again, evaluating where you are in this continuum uh, before you even get to, um, you know, their whole house heat pumps, um, their room by room heat pumps, and those, like my house, I have forced air heating, which is the most common type of heating, uh, residential heating in New Mexico is forced air. And you can ad adapt a forced air system to a heat pump. And it's much simpler than putting mini splits in multiple rooms. So, you know, there's, but there's you detail. Can, but you can also, you know, if you have, if you already have like a system and you just have a, a, a part that isn't getting warm enough, you can add a mini split to that part and see how it goes. I mean, they're Absolutely. very adaptable. Yeah. What we have at our house is um, a, what's called a hydronic hydronic heat pump because we heat and cool through our radi radiant heating system in our floors. And that's where our primary um, heating and cooling comes from. So, it, you know, that we just adapted to that. Um, and, and in some of these areas, um, I, I need to say, why. while well, Consumer Reports says that a heat pump can uh, cover all your needs, um, but that in colder areas, what might be more economic is to, this is what the sweep thing said, the report said, that in some of the colder areas, um, it might be more economic to get a less expensive heat pump and, and keep your gas heaters or whatever you have, wood, whatever, as backup just for those very, very cold days. Or you can get what's called a cold a climate heat pump and they, they keep, um, you know, the technology for this is increasing tremendously improving because partly because Department of Energy has a program um, for manufacturers and they get rewarded for this. Um, but you, that it's a little more expensive and that will cover everything, but you might have to enlarge your ducts if it's a ducted system. Anyway, so all this is very, it's lots of Thanks, Debbie. Yep. Um, to pull up from the weeds a little bit, um, in your presentation, you spoke about the need for the state to get involved and define some of these credit capabilities and that uh, those rules and that system need to be set up by MNERD. Um, and the, quite a lot of the question was, so what's the status of MNERD starting to work on that and getting it done? And is there any evidence that they're working on it? Or what do you know about that? So that's over to you. I don't know. I, I don't know, but I've been in discussions with people saying we have to lean on them harder. <laughs> and I have yeah, heard that. Andrew that. Stone put a comment in yeah. there um, along those lines. And of course, MNERD is uh, a department of the state government. So um, that's, uh, yeah, that's what that is. Okay. That's that's a, been a big concern, you know, not only with this, there's so much federal money everywhere. And will New Mexico have the capacity to go after a lot of the, these programs? Very good question. Um, here's a kind of a detailed one, but uh, when you talk about uh, qualifying for these credits based on income, uh, do you know if that refers to gross income, after tax income? Uh, Pre-tax. What do you What do you know about that? It's um. I, I think it's AGI adjusted gross income. Um, but I also, uh, if if you go to the website, you'll you'll the, you'll see it.